During the dawn of the jet age, kings were made and air transportation was revolutionized. One such king, the Boeing 707, led the way in the modernization of air travel to what we would recognize today. Boeing would design variants of the 707 to capitalize on improvements in technology and satisfy the needs of airlines servicing different routes. Despite being a king of the sky, the 707 would only see a decade of dominance before becoming a victim of its own success and falling to the queen. The 707 revolutionized transportation in the 1960s with effects rippling to this day despite the technical and social limitations on early passenger jets. The Boeing 707 may not have been the first jet aircraft, but it was largely responsible for ushering in the jet age and left a legacy that has become the basis for modern passenger aircraft design. The American-made single-aisle, quad-jet engine aircraft would introduce the public to the marvels of international travel and become an icon for the golden age of flying. Its primary competition was the Douglas DC-8. Between the two, 707 was the riskier bet at the time, since Douglas had a better track record with passenger aircraft, having produced popular piston engine airplanes such as the DC-4. While the 707 seems familiar enough, the flight experience would be unrecognizable to a modern passenger on a long-haul route, with its narrow body and many refueling stops. It is worth remembering that the first flight of the Boeing 707 on December 27, 1957, is closer to the first flight of the Wright Flyer on December 17, 1903, than it is to us in the year 2020. Before taking off on this journey with the 707, it is worth taking a quick and dirty look at some of the peer aircraft that would have flown alongside the Boeing jet while facing many of the same challenges and limitations. The American Douglas DC-8 is powered by four Pratt & Whitney JT-3C turbojet engines mounted in separate nacelles suspended by pylons under the wings and was the primary competitor to the 707, achieving similar levels of commercial success. The Convair 880 and 990 was yet another American airplane with four GE CJ805 turbojet engines under the wings, but designed to be faster than the 707. However, it did not achieve commercial success. The Vickers VC-10 was a British-made aircraft designed for use flying into under-equipped airports, prompting designers to equip four Rolls-Royce Conway Arco 42 turbofan engines in dual nacelles mounted on the tail and was mostly purchased by British or Commonwealth Airlines. The Soviet-made Illusion Il-62 also utilized four Kuznetsov NK-8 turbofan engines mounted on the tail for the same purpose of serving under-equipped airports throughout the Soviet Union and her satellite states. Honorable mentions go to the Soviet Tupolev Tu-114 and the British de Havilland DH-106 Comet as they cannot exactly be considered peer aircraft to the 707, but played an important role ushering in the jet age. Tu-114 did not have jet engines, but is the fastest civilian turboprop airplane in the world to this day, with four Kuznetsov NK-12 turboprop engines. TU-114 is deserving of an honorable mention for serving as the main long-haul workhorse of Aeroflot before the jet-engined Eel-62 was ready in addition to being faster than the de Havilland Comet, the first jet aircraft. The de Havilland Comet was about 100 miles per hour slower than the 707, slower than the turboprop TU-114, and had an abysmal safety record with several mid-air explosions resulting from metal fatigue due to the pressurization process exacerbated by square windows. However, it still holds the honor of the world's first civilian jet aircraft with four de Havilland DH Ghost 50 turbojet engines embedded in the wings. Its design shortcomings that contributed to the poor safety record allowed for Boeing and other aircraft manufacturers to learn from de Havilland's mistakes and create a more reliable aircraft to usher in the jet age, eliminating square windows altogether from future aircraft design and making it deserving of an honorable mention. Before there was the Boeing Model 707, there was the prototype model 367-80, more commonly referred to as the Dash 80. This prototype jet airframe was based off of the piston engine Boeing Model 367, which was also the design basis for the C-97 Strato Freighter and 377 Strato Cruiser piston engined aircraft. Powered by four Pratt & Whitney JT-3D engines, the Dash 80 would be the first passenger jet aircraft to feature engines mounted in separate nacelles suspended by pylons under the wings. A revolutionary design choice at the time for ease of engine maintenance, the wing-mounted engine would become a staple of passenger aircraft into the modern era. 
The Dash 80 first took to the skies on July 15, 1954 and began its life as a prototype demonstration aircraft to woo potential buyers. During one such event on August 7, 1955, Boeing test pilot Elvin Tex Johnston made last-minute plans to scrap a planned flyover of a crowd of 250,000 at Lake Washington in Seattle during the Gold Cup hydroplane races and instead performed two successive barrel rolls in the new jet airliner, amusing the crowd and horrifying Boeing executives. On December 20, 1957, the Boeing 707 first took to the skies, entering commercial service less than a year later on October 26, 1958, with Pan American World Airways on a route from New York to Paris. The inaugural scheduled flight included a stopover for fuel in Gander, Newfoundland, and took 8 hours and 41 minutes, a drastic reduction from the flight time of a DC-4 piston engine aircraft, which could make the same trip in 23 hours and 45 minutes with two technical stops for fuel. Today, that same flight clocks in around 7 hours and 15 minutes non-stop. The drastic reductions in flight times, combined with a 174-person capacity, about double that of a 95-person Lockheed Super Constellation, allowed the 707 to introduce international travel to the masses. The increase in capacity meant that the cost of a flight could be spread out across more people, reducing airfares and in turn allowing more people to afford the cost of travel. The trend for an increasing capacity allowed the 707 to flourish in the 60s and fail in the 70s. The launch model 707-120 had a range of about 3,000 miles, with a flight ceiling of 41,000 feet and a max speed of 600 miles per hour, making the plane capable of North American transcontinental flights as well as one-stop transatlantic flights. Less than a year later, by August 1959, the long-range model 707-320 was entering service with Pan Am and eliminating the need for a refueling technical stop on transatlantic flights. The long-range version utilized the higher-rated Pratt & Whitney JT-4 a turbojet engines as well as a modified wing for increased fuel capacity and aerodynamic performance. Additionally, the 320 fuselage was stretched, increasing the all-economy capacity of the plane to 189, up from 174 on the 707-120. In a two-class configuration, the 320 had a capacity of 141, one less person than the 120, allowing for increased comfort for the upper-class cabin. The increases in performance on the 707-320 resulted in a fully loaded range of about 4,400 miles, enabling non-stop transatlantic travel. By 1960, operators of the Boeing 707 included the likes of Pan Am, TWA, American Airlines, Qantas, Air France, BOAC, Lufthansa, and others. Some of these airlines had their own unique needs entering the jet age, and Boeing was happy to oblige, infamously creating Model 720 as a short to medium range variant of the 707. With the fuselage truncated by 9 meters for improved performance on shorter runways, Boeing decided to change the name to 720 so the shorter range plane would not be seen as competing with the longer range DC-8. The Model 707-420 was created for European airlines being an exact, if not more chill, copy of Model 320, but utilizing Rolls-Royce Conway Arco-12 turbofan engines. These were a precursor to the Arco-42 engines used on the VC-10 and allowed for improved three-engine performance in the event of an engine failure. Turbofans pushed some of the air intake around the jet engine to increase performance, and the 707-420 was the first passenger jet to equip them, entering service with Lufthansa in March 1960. The gains in efficiency prompted Boeing to revise the 120 and 320 by using Pratt & Whitney JT-3D turbofan engines in combination with wing modifications. The newly created 707-120B in March 1961 and 707-320B in June 1962 were the most efficient passenger 707 variants created. These efficiency improvements increased the fully loaded range of the 120B to 4,000 miles and 320B to 5,750 miles. The gains in efficiency and range allowed the turbofan engines to quickly become the standard jet engine type, causing a trend for bigger engines. During the launch of the 707-120, Australian-based airline Qantas worked with Boeing to develop a special variant for their use. The 707-138 was a modified 120 with a shortened fuselage and different engines to improve efficiency when landing on shorter or hotter runways for refueling and allowed for increased range on Trans-Pacific flights. The new Pratt & Whitney JT-3C-6 turbojet engines allowed for extra thrust when taking off from the shorter 7,000-foot runway in Nandi, Fiji. The increase in range allowed Qantas to safely push the plane to its limits, flying between spread out islands in the Pacific Ocean. Qantas would go on to upgrade some of their 138s with Pratt & Whitney JT-3D turbofan engines in 1961, making the 707-138B to further increase operating efficiency on long-haul routes. 
707 made travel between Australia and the UK much more accessible to the masses, but routes still required creative thinking to satisfy the technical limitations of the 707. The Kangaroo route between London and Sydney took 34 hours and 30 minutes after departure from London, with technical stops in Rome, Beirut, Karachi, Calcutta, Singapore, and Darwin before landing in Sydney. This flight time was a revolutionary improvement from the 28-day ocean liner journey, and about half the time of the 63-hour and 45-minute piston engine super constellation, but still a far cry from the 19 hours, 19-minute flight time recently made on a 787 non-stop flight between London and Sydney during Qantas's Project Sunrise tests. Nonetheless, this short flight between the two culturally linked cities made it possible for the first time in history for the average working Australian to be able to consider traveling overseas on a four-week vacation. On a piston engine Lockheed Constellation in 1947, such a trip would require 130 weeks of savings on an average Australian salary. With the introduction of the 707 and the Jet Age, the savings time for such a trip would take 32 weeks in 1960 and would be further reduced to 22 weeks in 1965. Today that trip costs about a single average weekly wage. In 1967, BOAC introduced a Southern Cross route between London and Sydney. This route would depart London before making stops in New York, San Francisco, Honolulu, and Nandi before landing in Sydney, cutting the flight time to 33 hours. The name Southern Cross is taken from the direction of the flight from London, south and crossing down towards Australia. The 707 for the first time in history made most of the world accessible in under 24 hours especially when you forget about Australia. This accomplishment in shrinking the world was done despite the technical and geopolitical limitations of the era. Not only did the 707 have a range greatly reduced from a modern long-haul airliner, but the geopolitical situation of the Cold War prevented direct access between Europe and Asia. The USSR prevented most non-Soviet airlines from overflying the country and taking the shortcut to East Asia through airspace directly above Russia, known as the Siberian Corridor. The Soviet Union did not take incursions into their airspace lightly, Korean airlines learning this the hard way having two planes shot out of the sky after incursions on Soviet airspace. Korean Airlines Flight 902, a 707, was shot down on April 20, 1978 over Murmansk. Perhaps more infamous was the shooting down of Korean Airlines Flight 007, a Boeing 747, on September 1, 1983 over Sockland Island. Because this airspace was difficult to get permission to fly over without being shot down, European and East Asian airlines had to get creative with their routing, and the so-called polar route to Asia was born. A BOAC 707 from London on its way to Tokyo would fly over the North Pole before making a technical stop in Anchorage, Alaska. After refueling was complete, the 707 would continue the trip to Tokyo, completing the flight in about 17 hours and 30 minutes. The same flight on BOAC between London and Tokyo before the polar route on the de Havilland Comet, the world's first commercial jet airplane, would take about 33 hours in 1953 and 1954 on flight 914, taking off from London on Friday evening with stops in Rome, Beirut, Bahrain, Karachi, Calcutta, Rangon, Bangkok, and Manila before arriving in Tokyo on Sunday morning. While the comet had a cruising speed of 460 miles per hour, about 100 less than the 707, it was still jet powered and the vast majority of the additional flying time is the result of flying the long way around the Soviet Union. Flights from the United States to East Asia would frequently involve a stop in either Honolulu or Anchorage before continuing on to their destination. However, by 1961, Pan Am had introduced the first non-stop trans-Pacific flights to Tokyo from San Francisco. This service pushed the 707-320 range to its extremes. During that same time, Northwest Airlines was providing weekly one-stop service from New York to Tokyo through Anchorage on its polar route. Once in Tokyo, both Pan American Airways and Northwest Airlines would utilize their fifth freedom rights obtained by the airlines in the Japan-United States Bilateral Air Transport Agreement of 1952. Simply, aviation's fifth freedom allows for an airline of country A to operate flights and carry revenue paying passengers from country B to country C. With this freedom, Northwest and Pan Am used Tokyo as a foreign hub to expand their route networks in Asia with destinations such as Hong Kong and Seoul. These fifth freedom rights were passed along through mergers, with United Airlines gaining Pan Am's Tokyo hub and Delta Airlines taking over Northwest's operation. In recent years, Delta and United have both dismantled their fifth freedom bases in Tokyo in favor of point-to-point -point flights from the U.S. West Coast 
thanks to modern twin-engine extended range aircraft. The end for the 707 was spelled out by the 747. A victim of its own success, the 707 allowed for air travel to become accessible to the masses, and thus the masses wanted to fly, in order to accommodate the increase in demand with the existing infrastructure. Either more people could be taken per flight, or more flights per day needed to be made. At the time, the future was thought to be in supersonic travel. Boeing's A-Team was working on the sleek 2707 supersonic airliner. A consortium of European aircraft manufacturers were working on the Concorde and the Soviet Tupolev Design Bureau was developing the TU-144. The 747, on the other hand, was big and bulky and designed to fly as many people as possible at subsonic speeds using the new wide-body fuselage concept. Pan Am CEO Juan Tripp is responsible for the 747 reaching the market, placing an order for 25 of the launch model. While the 2707 never flew, the Concorde never achieved commercial success, and the TU-144 only flew passengers for less than a year, the Boeing 747 became queen of the skies and can still be flown on today. While the 747 did not immediately mark the retirement of the 707, it did push the 707 out of the long-range market from above, and more efficient twin-engine jets like the DC-9 and 737 were pushing quad-engine jets like the 707 out of short to medium-range domestic routes from below. The 707 could be flown commercially until 2013 when the last operator, Saha Air, finally retired the type. Despite the 707 having a rather short lifespan as a workhorse of civilian aviation, it lives on today thanks to military operations. Perhaps the most famous military variant was VC-137C, a VIP transport designed for carrying the US President and known as Air Force One while doing so. The 707 served as a backdrop for many moments in US history, including the swearing-in of Lyndon B. Johnson in the aircraft cabin after the assassination of John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963. The 707 VC-137C began service with President Kennedy in 1962, and much like the civilian version, it was replaced by a 747 variant known as VC-25A in 1990 for President Bush Sr. to increase passenger comfort and aircraft range. Another notable military application for the 707 includes the E-3 Sentry Airborne Warning and Control System, or AWACS, entering service in March 1977. This modified 707 can easily be identified by a large circular rotating radar dome mounted to the top of the fuselage. It is used to keep track of aircraft and naval ships in a military zone of operation. Additionally, they will identify if targets are friends or foes before sending that information to nearby allies and faraway commanders. In addition to the AWACS variation of the 707, there is also the E-6 Mercury Airborne Command Post. The E-6 is a vestige of the Cold War, allowing the United States to control its nuclear arsenal from the air in the event that command posts on the ground are destroyed in a first strike attack. The E-6 entered service with the US Navy in 1989 during the twilight of the Cold War with the last delivery in 1992 after the fall of the Soviet Union. Noteworthy is the KC-135 Strato Tanker, the predominant variant of the C-135 Strato Lifter, which was developed in parallel to the 707 from the 367-80 prototype for mid-air refueling. This resulted in a structurally different airframe to the 707, so it cannot be considered a descendant, but rather a sibling. Boeing 707 played a large role in revolutionizing air transportation networks of the past into a form we would recognize today. Technical and social limitations of the era make the 707 seem somewhat archaic from a modern standpoint, with many stops and smaller cabins on long-haul routes. But to someone of the 50s and 60s, the 707 would have been a miracle, literally shrinking the world before their eyes. It enabled millions to travel abroad for the first time and started a trend in democratizing travel that continues to this day. In upcoming videos, we will examine the plane that usurped the 707 from its throne, the first civilian computer networks powering airline reservations, and the airlines that used to be household names. With the 747, Boeing led the way in air travel revolutions with the first wide body just in time for the 70s, requiring fast new ways to book passengers and taking down airlines ill-equipped for the change. We take our time to research our videos right so you don't have to, but you can if you want to, as our sources are located in the description. A subscription to this channel is free and helps us grow while you stay dialed in to the latest videos providing in-depth analysis of civil aviation topics. We like the people who like our videos and welcome any feedback you may have in the comments below.